Welcome and thank you all for standing by. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode until the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star 1 and record your name when prompted. This call is recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this point. I will turn this meeting over to your host, to Ms. Ambreen Tarek. Ma'am, you may begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar on the Asian American and Pacific Islanders Historic Sites Campaign. I'm Ambreen Tarek, and I'm an advisor with the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, also referred to as WIAPI. Uh, today's webinar is co-hosted by WIAPI and the National Park Service. Just a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the WIAPI YouTube channel within the next few days. Um, the webinar is also a combination WebEx and teleconference, so if you have any questions, go ahead and enter them into the chat box that's at the bottom right corner of your screen, and we'll get to them during our Q&A portion at the end. Um, we'll also open up our audio participation lines after the, per after the presentation so that callers can ask their questions at that time as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we want today's webinar to spark conversation and generate lots of questions, so please share your thoughts and don't feel shy. Um, so just a little bit of background on the campaign before we dive in. This campaign is part of the National Park Service's API Heritage Initiative, which aims to recognize and honor the stories, places, and people of API heritage as part of our entire country's story and history. The National Historic Sites commemorate important elements of our shared national identity in American history. Of the more than 2,500 sites designated as national historic landmarks, AAPIs are represented by only 17 of these sites. So this reflects a startling deficiency in the light of their rich contributions to the understanding and interpretation of American society. Um, AAPIs have contributed greatly to building the heritage of our nation, and we're committed to increasing AAPI participation in historic site nomination and designation to better reflect our community's contributions. And so the main goal of the AAPI Historic Sites Campaign is to identify historic sites that are significant to our communities, and we need your help to identify them. So as members of the public, you can work with universities, partner with organizations to nominate a historically significant site for local, state, or federal recognition. So we hope the information that you receive today will help you better understand this process and also connect you to community resources so, you, so that can help you better maneuver it as well, and that way we can get more AAPI spaces nominated and recognized as historic sites. Um, so we're joined today by several speakers who have taken time out of their busy schedules to help us with our webinar. Our first speaker is Isra Pananon, Chief of, Chief of Staff for the Assistant Secretary of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. She will give an overview of what the AAPI Heritage Initiative is and how you can stay involved and get involved. Next is Kathy Cochin, <clears throat> who is a member of the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. She will give an inside look on historic preservation. We're also joined by Jimmy Jacobs, Acting Brand Chief of the National Historic Landmarks Program. He will walk us through in detail how to nominate a site to the National Historic Register or as a National Historic Landmark. And finally, we have Michelle Magalong, Chair of Asian Pacific Islander Americans in Historic Preservation and she will discuss the importance of capturing intangible history through the East at Main Street APIA mapping project. Immediately following our speaker's presentation, we'll open up uh, for questions and comments and then provide some final thoughts on next steps before wrapping up. So with that, I will turn it over to Isra. Hey, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> I think you stole some of my talking points, but I'll go uh, into more detail. Again, my name is Isra Pananon, and I am the Chief of Staff to the Assistant Secretary for Fish and Wildlife and Parks uh, at DOI. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone on this call for taking the time out of your busy schedule to tune in to uh, today's webinar. So the AAPI Heritage Initiative was announced in the spring of 2013 by Secretary Ken Salazar with the hopes of telling our nation's story and uh, history through a diverse lens. We actually kicked off this initiative by hosting a heritage forum in, con in conjunction with WIAPI and brought in over 450 people to the department from all fields and disciplines. Uh, it was really the, the first time that we gathered our communities to talk about heritage and preserving history on a large scale. Uh, the AAPI Heritage Initiative is the overarching or umbrella initiative that is comprised of three components. 
The first component is the theme study, which is a collection of essays capturing the contributions of AAPIs to American history. The second component is capturing intangible history, which is basically our effort to recognize AAPI history that is not based on a physical site. Uh, an example of this are the many publications released by the National Park Service intended for all audiences to include um, our communities, schools, universities, basically all interested parties. Lastly, we are here today to talk about our historic sites campaign. This is our effort to work with all of you to nominate and increase the amount of API related sites that are recognized as national historic landmarks or on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, this is important for a number of reasons. Um, again, I'll reiterate, um, number one, only 70 <laughs> out of 2,500 sites are API related um, and on a whole I think less than 10% of all sites are, are dedicated to uh, diverse communities or communities of color. Uh, number two, in order to preserve history for future generations, we must recognize and protect these places and their associated stories um, and meaning. And lastly, this is something that we can all be invested and involved in. You personally can recommend sites of interest through our NPS public comment site, which is linked at the end of this presentation. I also find this personally important because I am a first generation Thai American and would like to see our shared heritage reflected in our nation's history. Uh, I've had, uh, through working through DOI and just on, on personal travel, I've, I've, I've been to several national parks and sites and when you connect with a place or story that is a reflection of your heritage, it's, it's really deeply meaningful and poignant. Uh, I encourage all of you to get involved and I appreciate your willingness to to let me share uh, my thoughts with you. So now I'd like to turn this over to my uh, colleague and friend, Kathy Cochin, and she's gonna talk about historic preservation. Thanks again. Thanks so much, Isra. Um, good to hear your voice. Um, again, I'm Kathy Cochin, and I'm actually on the call in three different capacities. Um, my day job is I'm the President and CEO of the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum, where uh, the nation's oldest and largest health policy organization, but we're also an anchor institution in the W.K. Kellogg's Racial Equity Initiative called America Healing, and in that way represent Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities with other health and civil rights organizations uh, at the national level. And I see this work around historic preservation as part of that. The second capacity I'm in is as a, a member of the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Um, and the White House Initiative for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders is a co-host and co-sponsor of today's webinar. So for me, it's um, also a very meaningful role to be here in that capacity. But perhaps the most significant capacity I'm on this call on is um, I am the former uh, president of the board of Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation, which is the friends organization of Angel Island Immigration Station. And so um, really all my remarks today are in that capacity. I'm no longer on the board, um, left the board in 2009 but was involved for about uh, 12 years on the project, and so um, all the things I'm going to talk about today is for, directly from that experience. So first I wanted to talk about the importance of narrative, and this actually does come from the racial equity anchor work. Um, Kellogg is um, actually heading up the Executive Alliance Boys and Men of Color work in the changing the narrative arena. And part of changing the narrative is really helping all of us as Americans understand where we um, see ourselves within the breadth and scope of this great nation. Um, one of my colleagues, actually Cornell Brooks from the NAACP, was telling me last night that he um, was reading about um, how you can trace the resiliency of a child. And if you go back and find out what they know about their family's history, it's not about those kids. So the kids who really have no family history that they can connect to um, have the most trouble. Um, but it's the kids who ha can trace their history back a couple, three generations, and that that history is an oscillating history. In other words, the history, the stories of their parents and their grandparents and their great-grandparents talks about not only success, but also trials and tribulations. 
And it's the ability to really understand that um, resiliency is a, a, a means of um, moving forward, that uh, resistance in some cases is really necessary, but how you are able to pick yourself up and, and proceed is um, actually a big piece of resiliency. And so if we think about our nation's um, successes, but also our nation's trials and tribulations, it's really the documentation of cultural and historic resources that really allows us as a whole nation to think about our place in the nation's history. And it can help us trace strength and resiliency, and it can also be grounded in place as well as story. So for me, the importance of um, uh, documenting and recognizing places of cultural and historic significance all contribute to this, the importance of the narrative and the importance of having our people uh, be acknowledged as being an important part of the nation's narrative so that we are each a part of this important story. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Angel Island Immigration Station. So Angel Island Immigration Station was where the Chinese Exclusion Act was enforced. Um, it, Angel Island is an island in the middle of the San Francisco Bay. Um, an immigration station was built and oper was operated from 1910 to 1940. And in some cases, we talk about it being the bookmark or the bookend to Ellis Island in New York City. But um, the difference there is in New York, the average stay to get processed was um, four to six hours. In, on Angel Island, because it was enforcing the Chinese Exclusion Act and many of the Asian Exclusion Acts that were subsequent to that, the average stay was two weeks. Um, in detention quarters behind locked and guarded doors. Um, and so the experience across the Pacific was significantly different than the experience across the Atlantic. One of the most significant things about Angel Island Immigration Station is that people were uh, um, slept in bunks that were five high, and they were lined up uh, uh, road by row, and also up, up against soft redwood walls. Over time, nearly 400 poems were carved in Chinese into those walls, and hundreds more were just paint brushed or graffitied onto the walls over multiple layers of paint. But those carved, deeply carved poems represent the direct primary experience of the immigrant from across the Pacific and specifically from China. And so not only do the walls of the barracks speak, and not only do the walls of the barracks represent a historic uh, a site, they literally are primary resource documentation of that experience. And so that's why uh, Angel Island Immigration Station was landmarked in 1996. So what I want to tell you about is the different stages of uh, historic preservation. So um, we were uh, once the uh, so Angel Island Immigration Station was kind of rediscovered in the 1970s. There was a different phases of the Friends Organization that kept it from actually literally being burnt down, um, but then later uh, efforts to try to get it landmarked. There were four efforts to try to get it landmarked over the years. And finally, in um, 1996, the landmark designation was uh, acknowledged by the Secretary's Office. Then, at that time, I got involved initially as a consultant, um, and then later joined the board and became the board chair. And so from 96 to 2009, so those 12 or 13 years, it took from getting landmarked getting the resources to actually get a, a real live friends organization as opposed to just a purely volunteer effort, so a staffed organization that could en engage in the, um, the landmarking, the design and engineering portions of preserving the site, um, and then finally getting into contract to do the renovation, and finally in February of 2009 actually opening the restored barracks. Um, so it's a very, very long time, um, and that's even from landmarking to the restoration of the first of six phases. Um, 
but uh, it, it's but it's a really important story that I wanted to share because that's what really what it takes in historic preservation. Um, in that time, in those 12 years, we were able to not only secure funding from places like the National Trust for Historic Preservation, who is a very important partner, private foundations. Uh, we were able to access two different state bonds. Um, we did get a federal authorization so that uh, the resources, federal resources could go to a state property because it's actually a state park. We uh, entered into a historic three-party agreement which allowed the federal national parks, the California State Parks and the Friends Association to actually share resources and partner together. And we also had to develop the kind of political relationships and leadership at both at the state level and the federal level in order to secure resources and to move the project forward. Um, I do want to just uh, summarize then um, some of the lessons we learned in that process, and I'm happy to take questions later. I, I don't want to go on too long. Um, in particular, some of the lessons we learned was how important the Friends organization is. Um, the Friends organization is that um, volunteer, a uh, nonprofit partner to the site that is going to actually make the preservation happen. Um, it is a rare uh, opportunity these days that either the feds or the state could somehow do that. It's really dependent on friends organizations. But just with any nonprofit, how do you get that started? How do you get your first grant or set of donations? How do you find a staff person who's going to initially work for very little? Um, then they need to build the organization, all the infrastructure that goes with an, infra, uh, uh, an organization, a program director perhaps, the finance and uh, administrative aspects of it, um, and then also all of the visioning work and the technical like architecture and engineering work that goes behind that. Um, so all of that takes resources and intellectual capacity as well, uh, intellectual resources as well as the organizational capacity. Um, you have to really rely on a number of relationships. The relationship development is so critical because you have to bring to bear so many different um, trades and specialties and levels of expertise to, to do all of that. Um, and then um, what's really, really critical is having paid staff. You need somebody who's there. 40 hours a week, who can dedicate all that kind of time to really get through that whole process. But I also want to acknowledge that it's really important to have a small, at least a small band of very dedicated people who have a vision in their heads. And in those 12 years from landmark until the opening of the first phase, there were many, many times where I was sitting around the board table and our board might have shrunk down to maybe only eight people at the time and I was chairing the meeting. I looked around and people were tired. And I would say to them, you know what? What if we just declared victory because we got landmarked, because we got federal recognition, and just closed up shop and went home. And there were many times like that, but you have to persevere through that. Somehow you all have to lift each other's spirits and say, you know, that's one option, to close up shop and declare victory, but there really is something here that's worth preserving. And we haven't come this far to just give up now, and we need to press forward. And let's just try one more year or one more quarter or one more month in order to just keep pressing forward. And what really um, I have been so gratified in doing this work in preserving Angel Island uh, Immigration Station is that um, with a steady um, step by step, foot in, one foot in front of the other, over 12 years, we really were able to achieve that dream that our founder had had way back in the 70s, which was to restore the barracks as a place of historic significance, of cultural significance, where our children and our grandchildren and generations to come could understand not only the pioneering spirits of uh, Asians and others who cross the Pacific to come to this country, but also the hardships that they endured and how hard the experience was and how unwelcomed they were when they first tried to come to this country. And so for me, um, again, kind of coming back full circle to the beginning of my remarks, 
that's why historic preservation is so important because it will continue to tell the stories of not only our people but of all people and what it takes for them to become Americans. So I'm really happy to take questions later and thank you very much for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you. Am I handing it over to Jamie? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, great. Um, I'm Jamie Jacobs. I'm the Acting Branch Chief of the National Historic Landmarks Program. And I'm going to be talking about um, listing and designation um, programs in the National Park Service, um, of which there, there are two major programs um, of equal weight. One is not uh, more important than the other. They both uh, do different things and have different purposes. Um, and I thank, thank you all, all for being here. Uh, it's a real um, honor to be involved with all of the initiatives, um, uh, of which there are four, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, later. Um, so to get started, um, if I could forward the slide. Um, so the 1966 National Historic Preservation Act is the uh, landmark piece of legislation that codified the modern structure of historic preservation in the United States, and it set out a system that had local, state, and federal roles and responsibilities. Um, Kind of at the federal level is the National Park Service. Uh, it's the location and the agency responsible for federal preservation programs. And per the act, um, the federal government's role would be, quote, to provide leadership for preservation, contribute to and give maximum en encouragement to preservation, and foster conditions under which our modern society and our prehistoric and historic resources can exist in productive harmony. Um, so in addition to a federal role, it laid out um, a state role, which came in the form of State Historic Preservation Offices, or SHPOs. Um, there, are a sh a sh there is a SHPO in every state and territory, and there are also THIPOs, which are Tribal Historic Preservation Offices um, for some of the tribes. There's also FPOs, which are Federal Preservation Officers for various agencies. Um, but speaking about uh, state historic preservation offices specifically, they coordinated statewide inventories of historic properties, nominate properties to the National Register, maintain statewide preservation plans, and provide advice and education for local communities. Um, so now moving down to the next level, um, communities are really where all the, a lot of the work is done. Um, communities are uh, where the grassroots efforts um, occur, no matter how a community, community is defined, whether it's geographic, ethnic, or cultural, or some other way, um, they provide essential energy and knowledge for historic preservation that flows upward and helps states and the federal government to understand how their communities are an integral part of the American experience and American identity. Um, community roles can range from rallying around endangered historic places to conducting surveys, to participating in larger dialogues about diversity and representation, such as panels and public meetings um, related to these heritage initiatives um, <coughs> recently enacted by the uh, Department of the Interior. Um, universities uh, are a key component as well. Uh, universities educate the rising generation of historic preservation professionals. University scholars are among those who participate in the review processes for nominations and on initiative panels. Uh, and student interns and student teams often complete documentation projects for a number of programs uh, in a number of different ways. And finally, um, the sort of fifth sort of group to talk about is our consultants. Uh, these can be individual consultants or consulting firms, and they provide they produce the bulk of the documentation for most federal and many state preservation programs. Um, so that's kind of the people involved, and uh, now I'll sort of dive more into. Um, uh, why we document and then the, the program specifically. Um, there are five primary areas for which cultural resource documentation occurs. Conservation, that's bricks and mortar um, type of restoration and renovation. Comprehensive documentation, uh, which the Historic American Building Survey, the Historic American Engineering Record, and the Historic American Landscape Survey, they're all uh, uh, programs of the National Park Service that produce documentation that's part of a national collection, so it's it's not for listing or designation specifically. It's just for knowledge. Uh, also, interpretation, so signs, tours, um, uh, what rangers might say on a visit. Uh, mitigation, which um, there is something called Section 106 in the National Historic Preservation Act, which requires um, a process of review if federal money is involved in a, in a 
project that may impact a historic resource. So uh, that process of review and the solutions for um, any sort of uh, damage or detriment to the historic place is called mitigation. Uh, and then finally, listing and de designation are the fifth areas, and um, I'll be talking about those um, a little bit more right now. So listing and designation um, is documentation with a specific outcome. Listing in the National Register or designation as a National Historic Landmark or local and state listing and designation, um, pr the programs are equal in importance and they do different things. Um, could I have the next slide? Thanks. Um, a National Historic Landmark, or NHL for short, is the highest level of historic designation in the United States. They, uh, landmarks were statutorily established through the National Historic Sites Act of 1935, so it's been around for quite some time, which was among the most important early legislation pertaining, pertaining to heritage preservation in the United States. Um, the act was passed at a time when the National Park Service began to include historic parks within its purview but the first uh, NHLs were not designated until 1960. Uh, the National Register of Historic Places, or NR for short often, you'll hear it as NR, was established through the 1966 National Historic Preservation Act, and all the existing landmarks um, at that time were entered into the National Register. Um, one, is, one program is not more important than the other, they just do different things, and I'll talk a little bit more about that now. Um, so the next slide will show you the pure, what we call the pyramid of federal recognition. Um, all prop, um, so what you see here are the national park units. As of um, December, I believe, we had 405. Um, we had 2,551 2, national historic landmarks soon to, to go up. The secretary is considering the latest group. And then over 90,000 listings in the National Register, representing over 1.7 million properties. So that's a lot of those properties are in districts. Um, all properties that are designated as NHLs are automatically listed in the National Register if they're not already listed. So what, um, what are some of the differences between the programs? Um, the NR and NHL programs, um, I should say, both require property owner consent before moving forward with listing and designation. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But for the National Register of Historic Places, it's history that has meaning either to the local community, to the residents of a specific state, state or the citizens of the nation as a whole. Um, and, and National Historic Landmarks are specifically history that has importance to the nation as a whole. And these two examples, uh, Dominion Hills um, outside Washington, D.C. and Arlington County is significant to its local community. It's um, a very typical post-World War II suburb, whereas Radburn, New Jersey, um, rises to the level of landmark for significance because it helped establish a lot of the patterns of suburban development that were used throughout the country. Um, so um, the purpose of NR and NHL documentation focuses on um, specifically on what the level of significance and the integrity of the property. So it, <clears throat> it clarifies why the property is significant and at what level and the degree to which it maintains integrity, which I'll talk a little bit later. Um, NHL documentation um, differs from registered documentation in that it also must provide comparisons with other properties to explain why the property being considered has the strongest and best association with the event, historic pattern, or individual. So the comparative context is key to national uh, uh, landmark documentation. And then it also provides a benchmark information that could be used to prop, uh, protect the property in the future. So um, how do we establish um, significance? So the NR and NHL recognize um, four and six criteria. Um, four of them are used most often. Those are the ones um, for NHL and NR. So criterion one or A is events or broad patterns in American history. Criterion two or B is individuals. Criterion three is American ideals. This was a very popular um, criterion early in the program, um, ideas of sort of American democracy and that sort of thing. It's used less often now uh, because it's kind of hard to create uh, these argument, that type of argument. Um, criterion four, or C, is for architecture, design, and engineering uh, significance. Criterion five is a compendium or district, and then criterion six is archaeology, or D. 
So the most nominations come in really under one, two, four, and six. Um, nominations can come in for both the register and the landmarks program um, for multiple criteria, but they have to. You have to demonstrate 100% of each, um, not sort of 50/50. Um, and a property listed under multi multiple criteria is not considered any more important than one listed or designated under a single one. So that's the sort of areas um, about how we uh, establish levels of significance and demonstrating significance. The other half of the, the, the sort of uh, process is establishing integrity. Um, so with the NR and NHL programs, uh, it's, um, it depends on the type of resource, but uh, what we usually say is properties listed in the National Register have to maintain enough integrity, and a property designated as a national landmark must maintain a high level of integrity. And what you see here are two schools built at roughly the same time. The Walter French Junior High School is listed in the National Register at the local level for education and architecture, and Central High School in Little Rock um, is a, a very important site to American civil rights history and the desegregation of schools. Uh, and you can just sort of see, at least with the window replacements and the, these two, and the, the building on the left, sort of the varying levels of um, integrity. Whereas uh, Central High School, which as a national landmark, has either its original windows or a very good replacement windows, just to sort of give you an idea of how um, integrity can vary on similar types of resources. Um, so. Integrity, to talk about uh, a little more deeply, refers to the property's retention of its historic fabric. And a property with a high level of integrity is one that does not appear to be significantly changed from its condition when the historical events occurred at the, prop, uh, at the property or during its period of significance. The NR and NHL programs recognize seven aspects, location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. And it, it's Integrity is um, its a somewhat subjective uh, process where you use um, description and observation as well as sort of linking it to significance. And so um, integrity, you have these seven aspects of integrity, but they don't all have to be 100% for every property. You sort of weigh them um, as a group um, relative to what the significance of the property is and what its condition is. So. It, again, it doesn't have to be 100% of all seven, um, but I won't uh, d dive too deeply into integrity. Uh, I think the general ideas of the seven aspects are, are represented by their, their names, and um, I don't really have the time to go too much into it. So um, just to keep in mind that th these seven aspects of integrity refer to ab above ground resources, and archaeological integrity requires a different type of evaluation, so that's below ground resources. Um, so I'm going to just briefly touch on uh, the processes for getting listed or designated. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. The key with the register is to know that all uh, the National Register is a program that starts at the state level and sort of funnels it up to the Washington office, so um, most of the, the work excuse me, is done at the state level. And then there's a series of review processes and then the, the documentation arrives in Washington. In contrast, the um, National Historic Landmarks Program is a much more involved process um, because of the significance of the properties. Um, and they can be initiated really by um, anyone. It could be a SHPO, a TIPO, a FIPO, a regional office, a scholar, a, a property owner, can make an inquiry to the Washington office or to a region. Uh, there's a whole series of review, and then once the nomination is completed, it kind of moves to another level of higher review with the Landmarks Committee of the National Park System Advisory Board meets twice a year, and it's a panel of experts in history, architectural history, preservation, archaeology, and they weigh the documentation. Um, their recommendations go to the advisory board, and then they make their recommendations to the Secretary of Interior, and the Secretary of the Interior actually um, signs off and officially designates the property as a National Historic Landmark. Um, so it's a somewhat more um, involved process, but just to know that there is a sort of, you can talk directly to the Landmarks Program. Um, you can initiate a project directly uh, with the Landmarks Program. Uh, 
at, at the regional level or at the national level or at the national at the central office, sorry. Um, whereas the register, it, it starts at the state. Those are really the takeaways uh, to know. So the time and costs involved. Um, so the national register, it varies from state to state, but it's generally less than a year. And um, we estimate that the value of time and or consulting fees to prepare a nomination is three to $7,000. And that, that, that range sort of deals with the complexity of the site you're dealing with, the size of the site you're dealing with, um, the, uh, the nuances involved with the argument. Um, whereas National Historic Landmarks are typically one to three years, again, you saw the, the review process. Um, it's a fairly lengthy one, and the consulting fees are higher because the, the documentation has to be um, a little bit more comprehensive, a little bit more in-depth, uh, and the process is longer, so it's about fifteen to 35000 again, depending on the complexity of the site and how many criteria you're using and that sort of thing. So there are some um, MPS grant opportunities that exist right now. Um, uh, the Japanese Confinement Sites Grant uh, is awarded to preserve and interpret U.S. confinement sites where Japanese Americans were detained during World War II. Grants awarded through a are awarded through a competitive process and require matching uh, $2 federal to $1 non-federal match, and the minimum grant request is $5,000, and you see the, the uh, URL there. And then there's also underrepresented community grants and the, the goal is to increase the number of National Register listings associated with communities currently underrepresented, including African Americans, Latinos, uh, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders, and LGBTQ uh, Americans. Grants can support surveys, inventories of historic properties, as well as the development of register nominations. And there were 2014 grants uh, for AAPI preservation work in Massachusetts and Utah. So these are um, great opportunities and a good way to sort of get get moving at the community level um, and, and start documenting underrepresented groups and stories. Um, and finally, I'm going to talk briefly about the Heritage Initiative. Obviously, we're all here because of AAPI. Um, it was preceded by the American Latino Heritage um, Initiative, <coughs> which has been quite successful and is moving into a second phase. The the theme study for National Landmarks uh, has been, the essays for it have been completed, and now it's moving on to the, the part of the pro project to um, find sites that support the themes uh, identified in the essays. The AAPI theme study is in the process of preparing the essays, um, so they're just a, a slightly behind the Latino heritage, but moving very steadily forward. Um, the Women's History Initiative was slightly different. Uh, they decided not to do a theme study with essays and instead um, use the money to actually just um, underwrite the development of nominations. So there's been uh, one nomination already put forward and two more in process. And then the, the newest Heritage Initiative is the LGBTQ Initiative, which the Secretary launched last May and uh, is moving very quickly forward. There's a, a large um, grant received by the National Park Foundation and quite a bit of grassroots support, uh, including some pro bono nominations. Um, so those are the heritage initiatives. We also have a science initiative that's starting this week, uh, a science project uh, to look at science sites. It's not heritage specifically, but it's uh, another area of focus uh, for underrepresented stories within the Landmarks program. Um, and that's it, I'm glad. Um, to have had the chance to talk to you and look forward to your questions later uh, in, in the hour. Oh, and I'm going to in introduce Michelle uh, Magalong, um, and it's all yours. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, thank you, um, everyone, for, for joining us on um, this uh, webinar. Uh, my, again, my name is Michelle Magalong, and I am the Chair of Asian and Pacific Islander Americans in Historic Preservation. Uh, which is a, a national volunteer-based organization that was established in 2007. Um, and the first uh, type of program we held as API HIP was our biannual uh, national API Historic Preservation Forum. Uh, the first one was in 2010, 
and we just had our last one, 2014, in Washington, D.C., um, and we have grown since then of just hosting these biennial national forums. Of uh, one of our first programs was the uh, is our East at Main Street project, which I will talk about a little bit in, uh, in our next slide. But uh, just a little bit more about API HIP. Our mission is to lead in the preservation and awareness of Asian and Pacific Islander American historic places and heritage. So we're a national network with um, over 600. Um, individuals and community organizations that have partnered with us through our various aspects of the East at Main Street project and with our forums and other related projects. Um, to learn more about what uh, we do, you can visit our website, which is apihip.org, uh, follow us or like us on uh, Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Um, and uh, next slide, please. We're gonna. I'm gonna talk to you guys about today the um, East at Main Street API mapping project, um, which I'm the co-director, and my other co-director is uh, Donna Grace, and the two of us have been working on this project for the last year. Um, we have started this project in partnership with History Pin, and it's funded by the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. Um, and basically, East at Main Street. Um, is a crowdsourced uh, project online where folks can um, contribute their uh, materials, um, stories, and things of that nature to a national map, um, which can, you know, one of the biggest aims we have for the East at Main Street project is to help inform, you know, future um, designations uh, to become national landmarks or to be on the national register. Um, and also is to engage local community groups um, to think more largely, more broadly on a national level on, you know, what do um, APIA historic sites and resources look like? Um, and to help inform, lastly, to help inform uh, the AAPI Heritage Initiative. Um, and so this project was in collaboration and we continue to collaborate with local community groups, nonprofit organizations, archives and, you know, individuals from across the nation that have a passion um, towards preserving um, API-related historic sites and resources. Um, I include here a, a very short list of our community partners um, that have um, hosted community workshops, uh, been on our webinars, and, and have contributed to the site. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and I'm going to quickly, which I usually do in two hours, but in two minutes, I will show you how to pin um, on the East at Main Street project. Um, it's hosted by History Pin's website. Um, so if you go to historypin.org and you click under uh, projects, well, first off, before you go click under projects, I, I apologize. First, you create a login um, with your username, and you could do that by having um, if you have a Facebook profile, Twitter, or Gmail account, you can automatically set it up through there, and you, you know, provide your information uh, to create a profile. Um, and then you go under uh, the Projects tab to East at Main Street. That's our project. And then you would then click on to pin your memories. Um, next slide, please. And then after that, uh, you have the option. There are three different types of pins you can pin. One is, uh, could be photos, uh, video, or audio. The photos, they can be, um, you know, if you have a scanner and you can scan those. Uh, some folks put, you know, they take a picture with their smartphone. Um, any kind of photo that you would want, uh, you can pin, uh, use that. Uh, video, um, you have to uh, provide a URL through YouTube or Vimeo. Um, and then um, for audio, also it's through YouTube, um, I believe also in Vimeo. Um, so you would select a type of pin that you're, you're going to do. There is an option, side note, that you can do a bulk uploader option, um, which I tend not to do personally because if you put 500 pins at one time, um, you may not remember to pin a few of that, um, those of the 500, so I tend to do 5 to 10 at a time just so I can give um, detail to each pin that I'm going to pin. Um, and when you pin, for instance, this one is um, 
from someone's scrapbook of a community garden um, in historic Filipino town in Los Angeles, California. So what um, you do is you populate that um, that pin of this photo with a title, um, a date, if possible. Um, you could even estimate, um, give a rough, you know, year, give or take. Um, and then you would also have to provide an address or a location. Um, and then other information that you can um, add in include um, citations, like if you grabbed it from the Library of Congress website, you can cite them. Um, so that's a web link, and you could provide your own narrative um, and key terms, like key search terms like uh, community garden or Filipino American or historic Filipino town for this instance. Um, and and once you do that, uh, you would um, click OK to, to um, pin it. Um, two frequently asked questions about uh, when you pin is one, the date. It is required, it says, but you, if you know it happened in the 70s but you don't have an exact year, there is the option to say where it scrolls down to say, you know, give or take one to five, you know, ten years or, you know, there's increments. And in terms of addresses or locations, uh, for many historic sites, those um, streets no longer exist. Um, they're new streets. You could actually manually drag your pin on the Google map that's provided, and you can um, put it in the modern day address um, or the street location. Um, and so, you know, for this pin, this pin can actually, you know, this one actually has about 10 pins right now um, at this community garden showing different video um, photographs during different time periods. And so each address acts like a, a digital filing cabinet for each location. Uh, where people can contribute um, their stories. They can actually interact with each other. Um, if folks had more information about um, this location, they can have conversation um, through our project. Um, and then for us as API HIP, we're able to see what are emerging sites of concern, of endangerment, um, you know, what are places that we could potentially identify for designation, not only on the national level, but state and, and local. Um, levels, and so um, this is just one tool that we would love for folks to participate and join us in the conversation. So thank you for um, allowing me to present on the East at Main Street project. Great. Thanks so much, Michelle, and thanks again to all our speakers today for presenting and sharing all these great stories and resources. Um, so we're, we're nearing the hour, so let's go ahead and open it up for audience questions. If you have a question, please enter it in the chat box in the corner of your screen, or you can indicate it to the operator, and uh, when you're ready to ask your question, you can go ahead and do so over the phone. So uh, maybe the operator can help us. Do we have any questions over the phone? Okay, I guess while we're waiting for those to come in, we could go ahead and address some of the ones that have been typed up already. So this is a good one for uh, maybe Michelle, you can help us with this. Um, uh, someone has asked, what are some of the other opportunities to get involved with API Historic Preservation if we are not yet ready to write a nomination? Um, that's a great question. And um, as I mentioned with the East at Main Street project, that's one way to, you know, get engagement from community members to start even just that initial conversation about why does this place matter. Um, the nomination is, it seems like it's many steps beyond that, you know, um, and so starting off that conversation of recognizing and capturing the significance of a site, um, and also that creates, you know, um, buzz uh, to the general public about there there is a site that may be, you know, um, in consideration, and that can help um, in terms of recruiting more people to get involved, to um, developing, you know, funding and fundraising opportunities to help, you know, since uh, Jamie had brought up and also Kathy had brought up that, you know, it does require time, talent, and, and money to do the nominations. And as Kathy had mentioned, it, it's take, it took over a decade for Angel Island. Um, and so I think just starting that conversation and, and continually educating um internally and also to the general public of why that place matters is, is, a, is a good starting point. 
And I'd, I'd like to also add, this is Jamie, um, that a good good place is also to just become involved with um, community groups focused on history or focused on culture of a specific group. It's a great way to sort of get your get your feet wet and get um, get yourself involved, and then <clears throat> you can move forward from there um, as a group or or with other groups um, linked together. Great. So we have another question. Um, maybe, Jamie, you can help out with this. How do we find out if our site is being included in the theme study? Um, that's a great question. Um, as of now, they're probably, we're probably not to the point where we're getting down to the site level. Um, so uh, what you could do is uh, you could email me, um, and we, I, I could look and talk to Dr. Franklin Odo. Um, and see what's going on uh, and whether or not any sites have been um, uh, identified yet. I don't think they're quite to that point. Again, they're, they're sort of looking more at the thematic essays at, at this point. And another thing to keep in mind is that, you know, if there is a desire for your site to be listed in the National Register or made a national or go through the process for a possible designation as a national landmark, um, you, you don't necessarily have to wait um, for uh, the 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 AAPI theme study to sort of um, come to you, you could make an inquiry on your own if you had the resources or interest in starting to research your own site. But I'd be happy to, um, to, to speak with you directly or email with you directly. All right, so then moving on, we have another question coming in. Um, how do we find out, oh, I'm sorry, I just said that one, <laughs> for historic register or landmarks, is there funding available from the NPS once selected? Uh, there are, it's a, I mean, there's a, it's a good question. There used to be for, um, a program called Save, Save America's Treasures, um, which is currently not funded um, by Congress that uh, was a source of, of, of granting money available um, more often to landmarks uh, or at least um, properties of the National Re Register listed at the national level. Um, there's fewer um, granting opportunities uh, within the National Park Service right now just because of the general economy. Uh, and then the, one, the two specifically for AAPI were mentioned, or related to AAPI were mentioned in the presentation, but right now there aren't, um, there aren't tons of federal um, granting possibilities just because of the economic situation at this, this moment. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, we have another one. I think maybe you can help answer this one as well, or the other speakers can jump in too. So for uh, what are some objections a property owner may have about being nominated to the NR? Um, there, are, there are what we sort of call the sort of, not that any objection is a valid objection, but there's kind of the objections that um, make sense in that we've had particularly with the LGBTQ initiative, we've had some objections in the Bay Area um, from people worried about um, restrictions on what they may be able to do with their property, um, particularly in the superheated market that the Bay Area is in at the moment with property. Um, they may, but mo most often it's, are they going to be restricted in how they may use or you know sell the property or utilize the property um, for, the, the national preservation laws are really kind of laws without teeth, except for Section 106, which I mentioned earlier, when federal money is involved. Um, there's really no restrictions placed on a property at the federal level. Um, most, um, most restrictions are at the state or local level. Um, so again, it's just sort of educating the property owner about that there aren't restrictions specifically. It, it usually has to do with uh, private property um, and a private property outlook and use. Great, thanks, Jamie. Um, we're nearing the end of the hour, so I think we'll do two more questions. This one is for Kathy. Uh, you mentioned the importance of working with partners to not only prepare a nomination, but also after a site has been designated. What are some considerations to keep in mind when deciding who to partner with and how to manage those relationships over time? Do, did we lose Kathy? If anyone else wants to jump in on this question, you're welcome. Can you repeat it again? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. 
part. So in Kathy's presentation, she mentioned that the importance of working with partners to not only prepare a nomination, but also after a site has been designated. So what are some considerations to keep in mind when deciding who to partner with and how to manage those relationships over time? That's, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, this is Michelle. And um, I, from, from what we've heard from our member organizations, you know, once after the designation, that's not the end of a chapter or the end of the book, actually, but actually the start of another chapter in the sense of um, fostering the relationships with the existing partners um, and then, you know, maybe um, revisiting, you know, the different roles, responsibilities, and priorities Oftentimes we see designations happen or, you know, in the preservation world in general, um, you save a, a building and then the big question that after that is, and then what? Uh, so it's, it brings up big questions of sustainability um, and how do you keep that building, um, you know, thriving in, in, in a way that is um, conducive to the community. And so building those relationships with local partners and um, Really, for me, I've seen that it requires a clear, common vision um, with an understanding of what the different roles and responsibilities are. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I believe we have a question on the phone, if the operator can help patch us through. Okay, while we're waiting for that, let's do one last one. This one is coming in through our chat again. What are some of the most common mistakes you have seen applicants make in the nomination process? Ah, um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, one thing we, we uh, recommend to do is, for, uh, whether it's landmarks or registers, either be in contact with the state um, or uh, the NHL program at the regional or the, uh, the Washington office level. Um, just so you can get some guidance and assistance before you go through um, the process of spending money and time to do a nomination. Uh, one one thing that we just touched on is property owner consent, particularly for the NH NHL program, is, is really necessary. So we don't want people to move forward with hiring a consultant or actually generating a nomination that, that can't actually move forward. Um, <clears throat> And then I think nominations uh, in general, whether you're talking about the NR or NHL, you're, you're arguing, you're creating a historical argument for why this place is important at a different level. And so a lot of nominations provide a lot of interesting history, um, but don't necessarily have a driving argument for why it's important to the local community, to the state, or to the, to the nation as a whole. Uh, and that's just something to keep in mind um, uh, when you're, when you're writing the nomination or when you're hiring somebody to write. And it, it's why, um, you know, consultants who are professionals in this area are generally good. We do have people who try to write their own nominations, and it's not um, impossible, um, but the, the creation of an argument is frequently a difficulty. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, thank you again all for all your help and participation, and thanks, everyone, for, for your questions. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today for questions, but I know we have a lot more coming in. Folks are, are typing them up pretty quickly, but um, not to worry. We're going to get to all these questions. I think what we'll do is we'll post answers to all these questions on the NPS, the National Park Service AAPI Heritage Initiative website, which is www.nps.gov backslash history backslash AAPI. That's also on the last slide of our uh, PowerPoint. So all of this is going to go up, and I know several people have been asking how to get this information. We will be posting this webinar and the slides and contact information, so certainly we'll be in touch. So um, that website is also a great website, I think, to bookmark and stay tuned to because a lot of the great resources that we talked about today will be housed on that site along with other major program updates. So please make sure to bookmark that and, and stay tuned. A few other quick updates. The theme study that we discussed earlier is scheduled to be completed in early 2016, so please keep an eye out for that. And again, I'm sure you'll see updates on that at the MPS Heritage website. And the next funding period for the underrepresented community grant applications is expected to open in April 2015. So as you'll see on the, on the last slide of our PowerPoint today, there are a ton of other resources available online, and we encourage you to check them out and share them with your community. They're very helpful. Um, 
And thank you all once again for joining us today and making this webinar possible. If you have any questions related to the AAPI Heritage Initiative, including today's discussion, which is the Historic Sites Campaign, please contact uh, Theodora Chang at the National Park Service. Her email address and her phone number are listed on that site on the last slide. And that's all the time we have for today. So thank you all again so much for joining and participating, and have a great evening. And that concludes this conference. Thank you all for participating. You may now disconnect.